original engine. So you'll see I, you know, product ID 4 appears in all four of the tuples I reconstruct. Then I feed it into a selection operator that's selecting product ID equal 4 and store ID equal 1, and then those, four, those two tuples come out, and then I do a projection to get rid of uh, everything other than customer ID and price, and I get those two rows out, and then I feed it into sum. After the construct operator in the bottom on the left, I can use my standard relational database engine to, because I've formed rows and I can feed that into the rest of the query. Now, late materialization tries to avoid gluing values together until the very end. So here again, I have my four columns of data. And I'm going to start two select operators, one running on the first column and one running on the second column. And they're going to select values that satisfy the predicate product ID equal 4 or store ID equal to 1. Out comes these positions or bit vectors saying, oh, um, for the row, for the values in the first column on product ID, I'm going to get a bunch of 1s. And for store ID, I'm going to get 0 because the first value in the column of store IDs is 2. 2 is not equal to 1. The position bit vector is 0. The second one is satisfies the predicate, so out comes a 1. Then the database system ends these things together to produce that bit vector in the, down there uh, in the middle, 0, 1, 0, 1. Then we start scanning the other two columns. The database system starts scanning the other two columns. It uses that uh, bit vector to figure out what values it should pick up. It keeps things in order. Um, it finally glues them together uh, to produce rows, finally produces the sum, and finally produces the final value. So if you look at this picture, a lot, a lot more boxes uh, that uh, the database system has to run. But the trade-off can be huge. And this is from a paper I wrote a few years ago with some uh, colleagues at MIT. Um, and what I've graphed here, these are a couple TPCH queries uh, um, on some scale 10 data. Uh, the, red, the, the red stuff, those red bars are early materialization. The green bars are for various selectivity factors, late materialization. So for some queries, delaying materialization and doing late materialization can buy another factor of five in performance, which is why it's really important to, to uh, do late materialization to maximize performance. OK, almost done. Now, so the summary on materialization, you can either do things early and make your life simple, do things late, make your query processor a little more complicated, get a big performance improvement. When you have joins, you've got to materialize, basically, before you do the join. There are a bunch of queries without joins. Then you can materialize very, very late. You can actually operate on compressed data, a topic I'm going to skip. As columns are being fed into a join, it turns out it's just best for the database system to materialize those columns back into rows and have the join operators operate on rows. In a parallel database system, because the column store can be operated inside a node of a parallel database system. Before you redistribute data between nodes, you need to materialize um, the, uh, the full tuples before you ship things around. As I said earlier, updates, there is no free lunch. Um, you want your data warehousing queries to run fast, um, and you adopt a column store storage structure for your tables. Um, we're going to do everything possible to make those queries run really, really fast. Um, but we're not going to be, be very nice to you when it comes to updates. Typical solution is to uh, add, you have the base table, and you have a, a second table, which is stored in a row store format, which is stored, which con contains newly inserted tuples and deleted tuples. And you run the queries against all three. And every once in a while, you do a, a maintenance operation of recreating the column store values. But there's some papers written. Um, it's a tough problem, and it's a, it's a trade-off. That's why I said there's specialization coming, that if your workload is dominated by read-intensive queries with small, you know, trickle feed appends, not many updates in place, column stores can be a great solution to get great performance out of the hardware. I'm going to skip those in the interest of time. Um, turn, let me just say, it turns out if a lot of columns are accessed together, um, Maybe you want a hybrid model. Maybe it doesn't have to be a pure row store. Maybe it can be a hybrid model which combines the two. And there are a lot of papers that are starting to appear, and some products are starting to appear that adopt a hybrid strategy. 
uh, we have an old one that's, uh, uh, that we developed a number of years ago. But it's, my time is out. OK, key points to remember for the quiz. Um, first glance, you might say, I love those hardware guys. 1,000x processor, faster processors, 1,000x bigger memories, 10,000x bigger disk. So that's, that's the good part. Memorize those numbers. These disks have enabled data collection analysis, which is just unprecedented. Um, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but it, you know, um, you know, it, it is uh, 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 a fact of life today. The hardware guys, however, have short-changed this. Um, the 10x improvement in seek time has made making OLTP systems run really fast hard. Um, and it's made doing data warehousing with the 65x improvement in transfer rates um, uh, equally harder, harder. Um, database performance, if you remember those stalls, is very sensitive to L2 data cache misses. Um, all this, these tra changes, you know, the changes in hardware, the lack of improvement in transfer rates for disk has made querying all that data we can analyze, querying it really efficiently hard. There seem to be two solutions, a two-pronged solution to this problem. Last year I talked about scale-out parallel database systems. That's one solution to the problem. Uh, that's sort of the throwing the hardware at the problem to and achi achieving scalability through scale-out. Uh, but always want to use smart techniques when they work. Column stores are a smart technique, and they allow us, they give us a new storage paradigm, and a, but with some caveats uh, in terms of updates. Um, so they're nice because, remember this little tiny pipe coming out of the water tower, um, which is the disk drive. Um, they minimize the transfer of unnecessary data from disk. They facilitate the application of really aggressive tech compression techniques, trading CPU cycles uh, for I.O. cycles. We've got few I.O. cycles. We've got CPU cycles to burn because the CPUs are sitting idle a lot of the time. And they help reduce memory stalls. Now, they are not a solution. They will not work for OLTP applications or any application where you update a lot in place. If, the, if it's mainly appends, they can be made to work very well. Um, there are some hybrid storage models um, uh, which are beginning to gain traction. Uh, I believe hardware trends are going to continue to force us to build special purpose database systems. We'll always have very good general purpose database systems that will work for a wide range of applications. But the most demanding applications, whether they be TP applications or warehousing applications or mid-tier applications, I think we will see database systems, oh, eight seconds. Big red light comes on up here. Uh, uh, I, 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 will, I think we will see database applications or database systems evolve to meet the needs of those applications. What are Microsoft's column store plans? Okay, so we talked about Vertipak, um, which is an in-memory column store that will ship part, as part of SQL uh, uh, Server 10.5 uh, later the next year, I guess. What I can't tell you, my boss isn't here, I don't think, is what we might be doing for SQL 11. But if you paid attention and didn't spend the last hour updating your Facebook page, you might be able to infer something about uh, what we might be doing for SQL 11. That's it. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, a few people, Il-Sung Lee and Rima Nemi, both who work for Microsoft, um, Sam Madden at MIT, Daniel Abadi at Yale, Natasha, uh, for all their help with this talk. Uh, Daniel and Natasha for letting me steal some of their slides. That's what good academics do, is borrow decks from other people's slides, but not too many. Um, Daniel Abadi is an assistant professor at Yale, a really up-and-coming up junior uh, faculty member in the database area. He writes a great technology blog, uh, Bingham, and you'll find his homepage and look at his blog. Uh, uh, it's a really, really nice blog. He's got great ideas. He's, he should be spending more time worrying about his tenure case, but he writes a great blog. I'd encourage you to uh, look at him. And finally, thank you very much again for inviting me back. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> 
David DeWitt. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. The only reason I stepped up here is I understand some of you have been tweeting about this session and how wonderful a session it is and asking the question, would this be on the DVDs? My understanding is that it will be on the DVD. Thank you, sir. Thank you.